Hi everyone. So today we'll continue with mathematical functions, characters, and strings. And you may have noticed that I posted uh, in assignments on Blackboard the homework, the first homework. It contains five problems and it has directions on how to solve it and uh, what is the required parts. I also posted it on uh, Piazza, uh, the link to the Blackboard assignment. So we'll continue with mathematical functions and we and uh, characters and strings. So this is where we stop lapse time. Basically, we wanted to see how to uh, generate random characters and with the math.random function. And we basically see that we can multiply math.random, which generates a value between zero and one, not including one, with the range of uh, the distance between Z and A plus one extra character because we want basically all the letters from zero to from Z to A. And we add it to that difference between the two characters plus one, uh, the letter A. And this basically generates a random character between A uh, and Z. Now, again, be very careful when you use math.random on different platforms, it has uh, different functionality. So I will show you how this code runs. And we we'll basically generate characters. And you see, first time it generates the character S, but every time you run it, it generates a different character because basically it listens on various inputs to generate uh, quite random values. Okay. So talking about characters, one common question that uh, I'm always asked, uh, asked is, uh, do we have to memorize the, the unicodes for these characters? And the truth is that you can do everything without even knowing the uh, unicode for the character A. So for instance, if you want to check if a character, the first letter that is read from some input from the user is between lowercase a and uppercase uh, z, or lowercase, uh, uppercase a and uppercase z, or lowercase a and lowercase z, or zero and, one, and nine, all that you basically have to do is a logical condition. If the character is greater than equal with uh, the character a, for instance, and is less than Z. If you want to check if it's uh, alphabetical in any kind of uh, letters, you can do a disjunction between the two conjunctions. Similarly, if you want to, to see if it's uh, alphanumeric, you can do a disjunction between all of these conjunctions. You can, you know that the conjunction has higher priority than disjunction, and then you can basically put all of the three as a disjunction of uh, two disjunctions of three conjunctions. Okay. Uh, now, another question that I see, what does star mean for characters? Again, characters internally are basically characters. Uh, there are Unicode encodings of those characters. So it would just do regular multiplication. Okay. So now one other class that is useful and why I used it in one of the examples uh, in the previous class is the character class. The character class will actually check for such conditions that we have here for you. So it has static methods that are basically used for identifying if a character is a digit, if a character is a letter, if it's letter or digit, if it's in lowercase, if it's in uppercase, if uh, to, uh, uh, in order to translate to lowercase or translate to uppercase. So I will show you demos for each one of these. So first of all, let me actually just copy the code that we have here, this one. So let's modify the previous example. So let's assume that instead of reading a string, we read a character ch. And we only are only we are only interested in the character at index zero. Now we can actually paste that code. So the code that we had before was basically just 
code to check if the character is uppercase, lowercase, Latin uh, alphabet, or if it's numeric. So if you run this code, depending on what you enter, if you enter, let's say, lowercase b, it will tell you that is in lowercase. Now, if you want to check if it's some uppercase letter, it will basically tell you that it's uppercase. And if you want to check if it's a digit, like six, you basically check if it's a digit. Now, you can implement all of these three conditions with the character class. So character dot is uppercase the character ch does exactly what the previous condition was doing the conjunction that is between uppercase a and uppercase z similarly character is lowercase basically does exactly the same thing as the previous code was doing and finally, let me just comment out that uh, character dot is digit basically does exactly the same again as the previous code was doing, the one that was checking if he's in that interval. So exactly the same code that we had before, uh, the same tests would work. So lowercase b, uppercase b, and six. In fact, if we have time today, I will also show you how to uh, read not only one character at once, but actually do a loop. So let me actually do that. So we can actually do multiple tests. So this will be an infinite loop while true, execute the following code. So let me actually correct the indentation. So now it will wait for as many characters as we enter, lowercase b, uppercase b, six, seven, w, and so on. Now, if you want to see if it's alphanumeric, you can do it in two different ways. You can create a disjunction. So if it's in uppercase, if it's in lowercase, or if it's a digit. So now this basically does all of those cases in one single if statement, and it will print it's alphanumeric, meaning that it's either a letter or a digit. In this case, we are actually looking at uh, uh, the Latin alphabet only. So it will work basically for is R is uppercase R, but if I put just dash, it will tell, it has no printout. Basically it's not an alphanumeric. And now if I continue five, it's alphanumeric, but dash was not. Now there is actually a method to do all of that is alphabetic basically the character. Another method that we had in the lecture note, notes was uh, is letter or digit. So now this basically works the same way as our previous code was. It works on letters or digits it basically prints that this letter or digit, but if we pass it uh, a symbol, it will not actually uh, say that this letter or digit. And that resumes the moment that you do enter a letter or a digit. One thing to be careful when you run an infinite loop is that you actually stop that program or either by typing control C in the console or stopping it from the uh, terminate button. Okay, a method that we used last time was to lowercase. If you read an option like uh, A or lowercase a, uppercase or lowercase a, you want to transform it into lowercase. So you always basically check only one value instead of checking multiple values. 
Now, talking about the string class, there are a lot of uh, functions available for strings. So what we saw before is the character class. It only takes a character and it basically has methods for checking if it's lowercase, uppercase, digit, and so on. The string class represents a string. That means any number of characters. It's within double quotes, and it may be from empty string to a string that has any finite number of characters. Okay. So, uh, oops, sorry for that. I clicked actually on the API for string. So for any API, you can basically go to the string API. I believe that it did not, didn't even so, uh, correct find it, but we can always try to find string API. And usually the first one that comes is the correct one. Java 11 would be quite good. I don't think that it modifies that often. The class string implements a lot of interfaces, including the comparable interface, which basically allows you to compare any two strings, uh, which we'll talk about later this semester, is basically used by a lot of methods inside Java. Like for instance, if you have a list of values and you want to sort it, you basically have to uh, implement for that uh, for that class to be sorted the comparable interface. Okay. Now, string is not a primitive type. It's one of the types that I said at the beginning of uh, uh, the semester that is a reference type. A reference type means that the variable of the type string contains internally the address of the object of the type string. So reference types are different than primitive types in the sense that primitive types, variables of primitive types, they contain the value themselves. Reference types actually contain the address of an object that contains that specific string. And the meaning of that is that when you actually create a string, the string is a reference, an address. Like for instance, you have sentence, sentence will be an address, of an object that contains the string. In this case, a statement is the string. Every character in that string can be addressed using an index. The indices start from zero for the first character, and then every other character is incremented with one, the index. So in this case, this has 11 characters. The indices start for, with zero for the first uh, uh, character, and 10 for the last character. This happens to be 10 from 0 to 10 are 11 characters. The string class from Java 2 uh, uh, standard edition has a lot of methods to process strings. One that you saw in the previous example that I was running for you is the character at method. So if you have a string, you can take you can return the character at any position. Zero is the position for the first character. And of course, uh, you, can, you can use any one of the indices for that specific string. So for instance, if for this string that we just created, we want the character at index six, we would use sentence the character at index six, which will return a lowercase e, because that's the character at index six. Uh, two uppercase, will basically transform all the characters in the string, a statement in this case, the sentence, to uppercase. So the result of the string, one thing about strings are that they are immutable. So once you create a string, that string cannot be modified. Meaning that the result of such a method like to uppercase is in fact a new string in memory. So it doesn't modify the current string sentence still contains basically the old uh, statement with lowercase letters. But when you actually invoke the method to uppercase, the result is a new string, the address of another string in memory that is now contains the letters in uppercase. Similarly for all of the other methods. So for instance, the substring method returns uh, a substring of the original string from index zero to seven not including the character at index seven. So in this case, it actually will return a space state. Then we concatenate that 
plus between strings is concatenation with uh, the string substring starting with index 14. So since this sentence doesn't contain index 14, this will return the empty string. And the empty string concatenated with a state, it basically it's a state. So you can basically see a couple of things here. One is that strings are immutable and this method actually return new instances of strings. You can also use them in concatenation, which actually also the result of concatenation is again new instances of strings because you create new strings and this will be again new instances of strings. So strings are immutable. Basically none of the methods that we saw and we will see uh, uh, for strings modify the string itself. There is no method to change the string once it's created. Any assignment that you have to, to a variable that contains that uh, is a string basically is a new reference or a new address to the new string in that variable. So for instance, if you have the word uh, uh, variable defined as a string and we assign to that word a string like my nephew, Steven. If you want to extract a substring of that string, so in this case, only Steve from position zero to five, not including five. In fact, word will be the address of this newly created string. So the variable word is now a new reference to a new string that contains Steve. So let me actually try to explain this to you in a figure. So let's can open paint. And what I will do, I will actually write the code that we had there. So we define a new variable word string word is equal with even. And later, maybe a couple of lines below, word is assigned word dot substring between zero and five. Okay, so first thing is the fact that, oops, that actually word is an address. So let's just say initially is null when you define it but then it basically becomes the address of an object in memory that contains Steven, okay? So this is basically an object of the type string. And the notation, the UML notation is that this is an object of the type string and it contains the string Steven. Now, the moment that we assign to the word, the substring from position zero to five, what happens with this object is that the reference to the old Steven is deleted. So now the address is assigned a new address and this is the address of another string also in memory that contains Steve. So this is also a string and this is only Steve. So strings are not modified ever, these objects, but the variables, they contain any address. So after we execute this second statement, the one to which we assign to the word, the substring between zero and five of that word, this, the method that you see here, substring, actually creates this new object. And when you assign to the word that new object is just, you copy the address of that new object to the, in the word. Okay. Yes, so one question in the uh, chat, is what happens with the old object, Steven? It's garbage collected. If there are no variables that are still referring to that uh, object, 
it will be automatically garbage collected from memory. Okay. But the way that this is implemented is internal in uh, Java. Uh, there are multiple ways to implement it. One is that you keep a not you, but Java keeps a counter of how many variables are actually pointed to this object. And the second way is mark and sweep. That means that you go over all of, you, the programming language goes over all of the objects in memory and marks them as uh, available for deletion. Then it goes over the variables in the stack and follows all of the links to get to the objects in memory and marks them as not marked for deletion. When you finish the stack and all of the references from the stack, you go back to the main memory and you check what objects still are marked for deletion and you delete them. Because that basically means that nobody is referencing those objects. So what I will do, I will actually copy this figure into the slides. So later you can actually see how this was done. Any questions? Okay. Next, string concatenation. So there is actually a method called concat. If you basically have a string and invoke, like we had two uppercase for that string, the concat method with another string, it creates a new string, which is uh, the concatenation of the two strings. But since concatenation is a very common operation in Java, the operator plus is overloaded for string concatenation. So when you basically want to concatenate multiple strings like welcome to Java, you can just concatenate them with plus. One other thing is that Java is weakly, weakly typed, meaning that you can actually concatenate a string with a number without having to cast a number to a string. So chapter plus two will become chapter two. Automatically, it detects that one of the operands is a string. So it basically casts the second operand to a string. Be very careful about the order in which these operations are executed because I can show you an example. So let's assume that we only have a system print statement and I want to concatenate some numbers with a string. So let's say that I want to concatenate two plus three with is alphanumeric. Plus operations are executed from left to right. So basically what happens is that this plus does addition. And then the result of the addition is concatenated with is alphanumeric. So the result of this is not two, three is an alphanumeric, but five, the result of addition is alphanumeric. So every operation, including those that involve concatenation with addition, basically are executed from left to right. Now, of course, if this would have been two concatenated with empty space with three is alphanumeric, this will basically be two, three is alphanumeric because this becomes concatenation. This becomes two, the character two. Then the character two is concatenated with the character three and then with the rest of the sentence. So be, be careful of combining strings with numbers. Okay. Also, if you want, you can concatenate strings with characters. So the supplement with a character B is supplement B. Now, there are a lot of useful string functions. I will go over a few today. So character at, character at is basically extracts the character at a location index in the string, returns a character, equals. So num uh, numbers are usually compared with double equal operator. But the double equal operator between strings compares the addresses of the objects instead of the, uh, the, the content of the objects. So let me give you an example, and then you will see what I mean. So consider that we have two strings. Uh, 
So we have string S1 is a new string that contains Steve. And maybe we have a different string, string S2, which is also a new string that contains Steve. So how is this implemented in memory? Basically, we have two objects. Each one of these is two objects so that contains Steve. So we have one string and we have another string. Both of them are basically strings that contain Steve. String. Steve. And similarly, string Steve. Now, the two references are basically two addresses. Each one of these addresses are basically the addresses of the two objects. So this is an address of this Steve. And this is an address of the second Steve. Now, when you use equality, so maybe you do something like boolean c1 is the result of s1 equal with s2. What happens is that it actually compares the addresses. Is the address stored in s1 the same with the address stored in s2? And they are not the same. Each one is a reference, an address to a different object that contains Steve. So the result of basically this comparison is false. Now, if you define B2 as the result of S1 dot equals S2, equals works directly between the actual objects. So double equal actually tries to compare the two addresses. Equals tries to see if the object S1 is actually equal with the object S2. The content internally is equal. So in this case, it's true because Steve is the same with Steve. So what you have to remember from this is the fact that when you have double equal, you are actually comparing the addresses. When you have dot equals, you are actually comparing the actual two objects. So you are basically comparing the two objects and those two are true, as opposed to comparing the addresses, which are totally different. It's kind of like comparing five with seven, two different addresses, two different numbers. Okay. So that's the difference between double equal, like we compare numbers before, and dot equals. For strings, in order to compare them properly as strings, we use the method equals, not the double equal. And again, I will just insert a slide here. So you can basically see this figure that we draw. Okay. Now, that's not always the case. So there are a type of strings in Java called interned strings. Interned strings are those that appear as constants in the program. So instead of creating a new string, when we have Steve, we just assign Steve to S1. And similarly, instead of creating a new string, we actually create a single string and the same constant and we assign it to the second variable S2. What happens in this case is that Java at compile time collects unique instances of every constant that it finds in the program. So this program will actually create another reference. Let me actually cut this. And this reference is to the same object that we saw before. So, and actually why not leave that there? So S2 is actually another variable 
but the content of S2 is the same address as the original S1 had. Okay. So now it doesn't matter if we are comparing with double equal, because these are two constants anyway in the program, or we are comparing with dot equals. Both of them in this case will actually give me true. But this only happens for this type of strings, strings that appear as constants in the original program. Okay. So these are not normal strings. These are strings that are created as objects. They are strings that are created uh, as constants in the program. So they appear in the program as a constant. Okay. So that's the difference basically between equals. Equals is always true. It's exactly true. It doesn't matter if they are internal strings or they are new strings. Equals will always be true. Okay. So let me also do this. Okay. You can test this. So both of these can be tested in Eclipse. I will not do that. Maybe you can do it uh, after the, the class today. Okay, equals ignore case basically does the same with equals, checks if two strings are the same, but ignores the case too. So for instance, lowercase Steve will be the same with uppercase Steve or capitalized Steve. Compare to is another method that compares two strings but actually gives you the distance between the two strings. So if the two strings are the same, you will get zero. If the first string is greater than the second string, you get a positive value, which in fact is the Unicode of the first letter that is different with the corresponding letter in the second string. So if the, two character, the first two characters are the same, if the first character is the same, it goes to the next character, then to the next character, the, the character, the first characters that are different, you get in com by compare to the difference in Unicodes. So basically you will get a positive value if the first string uh, character is greater than the second, or you get a negative value if it's the opposite. If you get the character in the second string greater than the character in the first string. Starts with, checks if a string starts with a given prefix ends with checks if a string start, uh, ends with a given suffix. Index of is finding a substring in a bigger string. So you get the, the position of the first character of the occurrence of the substring. And similarly, last index of. Last index of gives you the first position of the last occurrence of the substring in the string. Replace replaces uh, the first occurrence of a substring in a bigger string with something else. So you basically give what will it replace with. Uh, there are multiple replace methods. There are the replace methods that work for only one character. And there are the replace methods that work for substrings and replaces the entire substring with a different string. Substring, we already saw, it extracts a substring of a bigger string given an index up to the end of the, uh, the string or given two indices. And then it basically extracts that substring between the position, the begin position to the end position. Two lowercase, two uppercase change the case of the string and trim eliminates white spaces at the beginning, at the end of the string, all the white spaces. So we start with equals. So equals returns true if the two strings have the same characters, same letters and sequence, false otherwise. So it, basically it's the method that is used for comparing strings as opposed to comparing uh, the, the addresses of the two strings. The next uh, method that uh, the next part that we'll learn are the special characters. I already told you this actually earlier this semester when we talked about characters, that if you want to represent single code or double code or new line or tab, you would basically use the escape character, a backwards slash. It's like a person leaning backwards up. And basically you can see that you can add 
double quotes inside the string. They will not be the end of the string. They will actually be a double quote as a character within the entire string. Similarly, if you want to add new lines or you want to add tabs, you would basically, you can do it in the code with slash n for new line and slash t for tab. Next, character at. So character at given a, character, uh, a string returns the character at a given position. And of course, the indices start from zero and the uh, last character has the length of the string minus one. The length of the string can also be returned as met, uh, the string dot the length of the string. All of these methods are what they are called non-static dynamic methods. They basically allow you for an object of that type to extract a property. So in this case, the message length, welcome to Java, is 15. And the character uh, uh, indices range from 0 to 14. So here we see a couple, a couple of examples. Message.character at extracts the first character. Message.length returns the length of the entire string. Uh, one way to read multiple strings uh, is to basically use the next method. So the scanner is can be used, a scanner object can be used to read from the command uh, line uh, any string separated by spaces. Basically, the next method returns the first string in, in the command prompt up to the white space. White space may mean spaces, tabs, or new lines. And you can use basically the next method to read. If you want the entire line, you would use next line, cap, uh, uh, camel case, and then open close parentheses. If you want to read a single character from the console, you there is no method in Java to do so. What we usually do in Java, we read the entire line, and then we extract the character at the index zero, the first character. I usually like to use the next line method instead of using the next method for the reason that when I use the next line method, it reads the entire line. Even if I just use the first character, you basically get rid of everything that the user may have entered incorrectly. Don't use the double equal sign to compare strings. It compares their memory address instead of their actual address. Instead, always use the equals method. And this is a similar example to the one that I gave you earlier. Basically, if you have two words, word one and word two, both assigns a new string that contains hello, and you compare them with double equal operator, it will basically print false that these are two references of two different objects in memory. Therefore, they are not the same. If you do double equal, so here is an example. If you have a stack and you have an integer defined on the stack, you have two strings, S1 and S2. The two strings are the same, but this is only for, uh, for intern strings. So double equal does exactly the same with dot equals. However, that doesn't happen when you have uh, two strings created with a new string. Dot equals works the same. Basically, it compares the two, the two strings, no matter if they are interned or they are uh, uh, dynamically created with a new operator. It will basically, it, it will print true in both cases because it actually compares the content of the string objects, not the addresses. So the only one exception are interned strings, basically meaning that these are constants in the original program. So when you actually assign to both variables the same constant, uh, they are compiled as only one instance of the hello world or of the hello uh, world. So only one is created and both word one and word two will have that same address. This is only true for strings assigned during compilation. So you can't do it for strings that are created with a new operator, okay? That's why it's not never use double equal because if you use dot equals, it will work and it will tell you true, both for internal strings and for normal strings. So always use equals no matter what. Uh, what. 
And here are basically examples. Uh, in this case, I'm creating two strings, S3 and S4 with Paul. And you can actually see that they are different uh, strings. And therefore, double equal will give you false. And dot equals gives you true, because they contain the same string. Okay. For comparing strings, there are other methods. Compare to returns 0 if uh, the first string is greater than the uh, parameter string, positive value or negative value. Negative value if S1 is greater than S2, and positive the other way if the current string is greater than the string that you pass as a parameter. Then there are methods for comparing in uh, two with ignore case, meaning that it's case insensitive, no matter what the letters are in uppercase or lowercase, they will be compared the same way. It's kind of the same with compare two, but one of the strings was too lowercase and the other one was also too lowercase. Uh, starts with checks if the current string contains a prefix and ends with if it contains a suffix. If you want to obtain a substring of basically a given string, you can do it in two different ways. You can call the method substring only with the beginning index, and it returns the substring that begins with that index and ends at the end of the string or you pass in both the beginning index and the end index, in which case it will extract from the substring up to the end index. So for instance, if you want welcome to up to the space, you would ask message.substring from zero to 11. So 11 character is not returned. Basically it's up to not including the upper limit, the end index. If you want to extract everything after character at index 11, you basically can only pass 11 as a parameter. It will return the end of the, the substring obtained at the end of the string. Okay. There are many other methods. So another set of methods are those to extract, to find the index of the first occurrence. If you pass a character, it will find the index of the first occurrence of that character in the string. If you pass two parameters, the character and the from index, it will give you the index of the first occurrence of the character starting from the from index. So including the from index, if the character is at that from index, it returns that for from index. Otherwise it just advances until it finds that character. The same method works for substrings. So it returns the first occurrence of that substring in the original string, uh, is the, the index of the first character in the substring. Similarly, if you want to pass in the from index, it will try to find the first occurrence from that from index included. Last index returns the index of the last occurrence. So let's say that you have multiple E's in a string last index will return you the position of the last E as opposed to the index of which returns the position of the first occurrence of the first E. And of course, the same methods that we saw above from index and with the string and with the string from a given index can, are also available for last index of. Now, for instance, if I want to extract from Kim Jones the substring from position zero to let's say three, where uh, k uh, to k where k is three, basically from Kim Jones it will extract just Kim. Uh, similarly, if I want uh, the in this uh, in that string the substring from position k plus one up to the end of the string. Since k was three, the, the string from index three to the end of the uh, four to the end of the string is Jones. If you want the first occurrence of a space in the string, basically you can use s dot index of. So if you want to concatenate the first name with the last name, you can basically extract the substring from position zero to k, where k is three concatenate it uh, or basically for the first name, 
And then for the last name, you can extract the rest of the string starting from the position after the position K. So it's K plus one. That will extract the last name. So first name is Kim and last name is Jones. There are also methods for converting between strings and numbers. So for converting from numbers to strings is easy. You can basically just add to uh, that number the empty string, and that will convert it to a number. From converting from a string to numbers, there are two methods available. Integer.parseInt of the integer string will convert from string 15 to the number 15. So you can assign it to an int variable. Similarly, double.parse double of the double string, the string that contains a double value, will basically uh, transform from the double string uh, variable to actually a double variable that contains that number 56.77653. So these are two static methods that are available in the wrapper classes, integer and double. Later this semester, we'll learn what these classes are. They are basically classes that correspond to the int type or the double type as objects. So when you want actually, let's say an array list, uh, these are actually types that you can keep an array list in an array list because they are objects. They are not primitive types. In an array list, you can't keep primitive types. Java, what it does, is a process called boxing. Automatically, if you have an int, it transforms it in a context that accepts an integer, an object, into an object of the type integer. And vice versa, unboxing, if you have an integer, it will automatically be transformed into an int value. Okay. So this is something that I can show you. Let's say that I want to an object, uh, let's say i, but instead of saying new integer for five, for a value five, I can just assign five and automatically it's cast it to an integer. And similarly, if I have an integer object like this i, and I want to assign it to k, I can basically just assign it. This is doing unboxing. So from an integer object, it actually, you get an int primitive type. Okay. These kind of types are called uh, wrapper types because it takes a primitive value and creates an object around it. Okay. And it's quite useful when you have data structures. OK, printing. So one thing that you may have noticed last time is that when you try to print a number that has a lot of decimals, sometimes we may want actually just, let's say, two digits after the decimal point with rounding. One method that allows us to do that is called the method printf. So let me show you an example first. So let's assume that I want to print the result of one divided by three, but only with two digits after the decimal point. So system, ln, we have 1.0 divided by three. And of course this returns 0 0.3 in a period. So it puts a lot of trees after that zero. Let's say that I don't want this entire number, I want, two digits after the decimal point, 0 0.33. Maybe this is, I have to give somebody a third of uh, a dollar because we are splitting the cost of, let's say, a piece of paper. So for that, there is the method printf. Printf takes two parameters. Uh, actually, takes an unlimited number, uh, a finite number of parameters based on the format. But the format, usually takes at least another parameter. So really the signature here is not quite uh, the one that I have here is format and items, is the format followed by at least uh, basically any number of items. It's you basically have the rest of the arguments are corresponding to the format specifiers. 
A format specifier is a substring of the string that is that format that begins with a percent sign and specifies how an item will be displayed, one of the arguments that comes after the format. So percent sign is uh, basically like the, the uh, escape character. Now, B stands for a Boolean value. So basically, if you want to print a Boolean, you would have percent %B. Percent %C prints a character. Percent %D prints a decimal value. Percent %F prints a floating point value. Percent %E prints a number in the standard scientific notation, which is basically one digit followed by the rest of the digits followed by an exponent. So for instance, if you have, let's say, 45.56, I can print it with percent %E and that will print 4.556 E plus one. Uh, percent %S is a string, but the more advantage is the fact that you can specify dimensions. Like for instance, percent period 2F says that I want this float number to be printed with only two digits after the decimal point. So even if you have more digits, like 45.5678, this printf automatically trims down to the number of the digits that you specified. So in our example, so we printed 1.0 uh, divided by three, it printed a lot of digits three after the decimal point because it's 0 0.3 in a period. I can use, a specifier percent two digits as a float number and then give 1.0 divided by three. So now what happens now is that what we are saying is I don't want digits more than two digits after the decimal point. Moreover, I can actually state how on how many digits this will be printed on 10 on 10 characters. It will also align to the right hand side those numbers. So when you print it, it basically will print it aligned to the right hand side. So let's say that I want to print multiple numbers with two digits after the decimal point. I want to print 1, 10, 20, 30, maybe 40, and 50. And I print them all with point S. Uh, we should also print a new line, slash N, slash N, slash N, slash N. Each of them is printed on 10 characters with two digits after the decimal point. So it's quite useful when you try to print a table and you want to see in the table aligned, right justified, basically all of these values. So you can see when they have multiple digits uh, before the decimal point, then before or interleaved. So basically the first number tells you on how many characters this will be printed, right justified. Then you have the period that says how many digits after the decimal point do we want? And then the actual specifier in our case is a float. But this is used also with other types. Like for instance, if you have integers, you would use percent 10 decimal. And then basically it will be on 10 uh, characters, right justified the input that you wanted to print. What would happen if the number is bigger than 10 digits? Uh, I've never tried, but we can see 10. 10 and 11. I believe that it will print the correct, the entire number. The only thing is that, uh, so let's print a decimal. In fact, why don't I just count? That way we can actually see. So this would have been 10 digits and then we put another one at the end. So, I, oh, I can't even represent it. Uh, what happens if I say that this is a long, and then I have this additional digit, okay, uh, as a long. Good. 
So basically one other thing that I will show you later is that if you put an L at the end, it, the number will be taken as a long. So it will print the, the entire number, but of course not on 10 digits, on 10 characters. So you can see that it went over the number of characters that were available. That's because correctness is more important than uh, text being justified. Excellent. Okay, now bitwise operations. So when we write mat uh, mathematical operations, sometimes we want to represent numbers in binary. And we also want to do bitwise operations like conjunction, disjunction of the bitwise values. Uh, we would also probably also want to shift, shift left, shift right. It's shifting left is like multiplying with two. So instead of doing multiplication operation, which takes more time, you can do a more efficient operation, shift left with one position. And for multiplications with any number of uh, uh, powers of two, like for instance, multiply with four, it's shift left with two positions. Multiplying with eight, shift left with three positions and so on. So these bitwise operations apply to any integer types, byte, short, int, long. All the bitwise operators uh, can form assignment operators. So you can have conjunction of the current number with another number and assign it back to the first, 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 to the first variable. I will show you shifting with negative numbers because you are right, they contain the sign bit. And there are actually two uh, shift operations, those that preserve the sign bit and those that don't preserve the sign bit. So the sign bit will be moved with the rest of the bits. Okay. I will show you in a couple of seconds. Professor? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, just a quick question. In Java, you know, because it has the virtual machine, is it actually at the, you know, at an actual bit shift, like in the register, it's shifting the bit? Or is it, you know, like a simulated bit shift and a lot more is going on? Like, in, I know, like in JavaScript, you know, like a, a, a bit shift is not necessarily a, GIF, a bit shift. It's just like simulating what a bit shift would act like. It's the same in Java because, in fact, it's a virtual machine. But in the virtual machine, it's really, so it's on top of the processor. In several cases, uh, these are translated directly into processor operations. So I agree with you in that respect that is not, it's simulated, but it's simulated by the interpreter, which actually may be relying on the uh, operating system or the processor. And uh, are they still faster though? Like I know like in JavaScript, it was faster yes, to yes, use like yes. a square they are root function. Than multiplications. Of All course, right. they are still faster than multiplications because multiplications may actually take multiple uh, cycles while shifting is a single CPU uh, uh, cycle. So right. it's still faster than multiplication uh, right. bitwise operations. Thank you, Professor. But let's start with a simple bitwise end. So what does bitwise end means? A number is internally stored as a binary number. So something like this, one, zero, one, zero, one, 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 zero. And similarly, you have another number and you want to do conjunction. Conjunction basically takes corresponding digits like zero and zero is zero, one and one is zero, one, one and zero is zero, one and zero is zero and so on. So it basically takes the corresponding bits and doing the binary and or between those bits. If you want to see an easy example is this example. Basically, consider that we have two numbers, 12 and 25. And I want to do binary disjunction. 12 is 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0. Because basically 12, you can represent it as 8 plus 4. And 4 is to the power 2 and 8 is to the power 3. You always start from the right hand side with 0 index. 25 is this other number, 11001. It's 16 plus 8 plus 1, uh, basically 24 plus 1, which is 25. You want to do this junction, vertical bar, between the two binary numbers, which corresponds to those digit, to those decimal numbers. 
you basically vertical bar will do zero or one is one, zero or zero is zero, one or zero is one, one or one is one, zero or one is one, and the rest are zero or zeros, which are zeros, which corresponds to 29 because 16 plus eight plus four plus one is 29. It's basically the previous 25 plus the additional bit here, which is actually four. Bitwise exclusive OR or XOR is the hat, like we had in the case of uh, uh, disjunction, uh, exclusive OR. So again, what it does, if the two characters are the same, the two bits are the same, it's zero. If they are different, it's one. So you can see it here, you can see it here, that this become one. Complement is tilde. You may have seen this as the character that was probably used in CSC 150 or any other discrete math course. Basically, every bit is inverted. It's like negation. It toggles from zero to one and one to zero. Shift left. So let's start with byte. Byte is basically the standard byte. And we want to shift left with two characters. So basically, we use this greater uh, less than twice and it basically you can see that it shifts left so this we lose this uh, one zero at the beginning the first one zero but everything else is shifted left with two positions so the shift operator will basically shift left you can shift right it fills up with zeros on both sides uh, you can represent binary numbers like we had in the case of long. We have L at the end with binary numbers. We have zero B and then the binary number. So you can basically see here one, one, zero, zero as a binary number starts with zero B. You can assign it to a byte. Similarly, you can assign data to uh, also another byte. You basically have to use uh, eight bits. That's what a byte is. Now, up to one uh, Java 7, it was quite difficult. You had to actually see how many bits you have there. And if you can't assign it because it doesn't fit, like for instance, in this case, these two ones are out of a byte. You need eight bits for a byte. This was able to be represented because the first two zeros are ignored. They are basically just zeros. But this one cannot because it's an integer and you need to convert it to a byte, which you are not doing it explicitly, so it will not assign to the byte. Since Java 7, you can put underlines. You can actually put them anywhere, but usually you put them to separate four bits at a time, starting from the right hand side. So you have four bits, four bits. So now you can actually see how many groups. So this is one byte, another byte, another byte, and another byte. This is a four byte along an integer value, sorry, that is assigned to overflow. And for longer numbers, you can basically see how you would represent it. One other thing is that it's combining two things. First of all, that this is a binary representation. And second of all, that is a long. So basically L at the end stands that this is not only an integer number, integer numbers by themselves are considered to be int, but if you have the L at the end, it means that is a long. Underscore is just used for uh, own, like kind of like a comment, is for you to actually separate wherever you want in the string, in the binary number, so you can see the number of bits, but by the programming language, it ignores it. Right shift, with sign extension is just a uh, uh, double basically uh, uh, greater than sign. So for instance, negative minus 10 will still leave the bit for sign. So basically this negative minus 10 is transformed in negative minus five, basically being that uh, sign extension will leave the bit for the uh, sign in its place, which is usually the most significant bit in the binary number, okay? And similarly, uh, there is the 
unsigned right shift with zero extension, which means that if you have a sign, like for instance, minus, that's the representation right at the beginning of that binary number as an integer, and you shift it right with one position, now that's that binary digit be, uh, bit becomes actually a bit within the number. So we, we get a big value in this case, but a positive value because the, the sign uh, bit was actually shifted right with one position. So what do I mean here? Most of you probably will need an example. So is the following, an integer, is 32 bits, okay? So we have 32 bits for an integer. The sign of an integer is represented as the most significant bit. So it's basically here, if this is a negative number is one, if it po it's, if it's positive is zero. If we are basically shifting right without considering the bit for the sign. Okay, let's say that we shift it with one position. What happens is that this negative number now becomes a number of 32 bits, which starts with zero, because that was the filler when you do shift. And then the next position is a one. So now this becomes a very large integer number, which is positive because the sign bit is zero and the rest of the bits starts with one. So this is actually two to the power 31 already. That's why when we did the shift with one position of minus 10, it became a very big number because basically we had one zero one zero as the original number. And now we have one followed by, 29 zeros and then 101. So that's why, and that's the number that you see there uh, in, in, uh, in here, 21474836430. Okay. And that's basically the difference that Greg was asking about, uh, about sign extension and versus zero extension. Okay, there are two other type of constants that can be represented in number, as numbers. If you start a number with zero, it basically is considering that the number is octal. And if you start with zero X, it reads that number as hexadecimal. So for instance, FF will basically stand as 255 and zero 10 assigned to X. If you print X, you will see that is actually eight because this is eight in octal. Any questions? If there are no questions, I will stop recording.